I ask you to turn your Bibles with me to First Kings, chapter eight, chapter nineteen. First Kings, chapter nineteen, and we'll read from verse eight down to verse eighteen. The story of Elijah. The contest at Mount Carmel, and then God's disclosure to him in Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Verse 8, so he, the prophet Elijah, arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb. The mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the Lord of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Sapat of Abel Mehula, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael. Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Zehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now I bring your attention to this portion of God's word read in your hearing. Because here we have a very important lesson God wanted Elijah to learn. Elijah, his faithful servant. There was something that he needed to learn. And God wanted him to learn that lesson here in this incident recorded. And it is also a vital lesson that we who serve the Lord must learn. And what is that lesson? And why is that lesson so important to learn that God has to teach Elijah that lesson? Now let's first seek to answer the first question. What is the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn and which he also once asked his servants to learn? Well, the symmetrical pattern of the structure of the narrative 
powerfully conveys the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn. The symmetrical pattern of the structure of the narrative conveys the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn and which also God wants us to learn. And I want you to note the structure. This is a little bit technical, but this is essential. And I need you to look at your Bibles and see the symmetrical pattern of the unfolding of the narrative. First, we have the setting at a cave where God spoke in verse 9. Then he, Elijah, came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. So that's the setting. In a cave, in Horeb, and God spoke to Elijah. So that's the setting. And then we have the Lord's question to Elijah. Notice in verse 9, B, and he said to him, that is, I am, or Jehovah said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And then notice, C, Elijah's respond or answer to the Lord's question. Verse 10, he said, I have been very, very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am alone, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And then notice D, the Lord's reply to Elijah, verse 11. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, okay, so here God commands Elijah, go stand forth on the mountain before the Lord. And then notice. In verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11b. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and a strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then another element. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then a third element, verse 12. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And then notice a fourth element. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blow. And then we are not told that the Lord was not in that gentle, glowing sound. And then there is a repetition of that pattern, a symmetrical structure. If you notice in verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Here's the setting again that repeats the first one in a cave. And behold, a voice came to him. And again, God speaks to him. So in the cave, God spoke to him. And now again, in a cave, in the cave, God spoke to him. And notice the Lord's question. It's the same as the first. There is a parallel structure. Verse 13. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's the repetition of the same pattern. And then we have Elijah's reply, which is exactly the same as the previous. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the Lord of hosts. 
For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, burned down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Exactly the same. And then, as in the previous incident, the Lord replies to Elijah. Verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. That's the first. Okay? And Jehu, that's the second, the son of Minshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And then there's the third. And Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha, the son of Zapat of Amil Mehula, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And then there is a description of what they will do. It shall come about the one who escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. The one who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So, do you see the repeated pattern of the structure of the narrative? The setting, the cave where the word of God came. The Lord's question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then we have the answer, I have been very zealous of the Lord and they are trying to kill me. And the Lord replied and gives a revelation to, I, to Elijah. The storm, the earthquake, the fire, and that's paralleled with anointing Hazael who kills Anointing Jehu who kills. Anointing Elisha who kills. And then we have in the first pattern. The sound of gentle blowing. And this time and in that and in this time we are not told that God was not in that. And that is parallel to the last incident in the narrative when God said to Elisha, I will leave 7,000 in Israel who, will not, who has not bowed their knees to Baal and who has not kissed him. Now, what was the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn? What was the lesson? The wind. The earthquake, the fire, correspond to the political and social and violent accomplishments of Hazael, Jehu, and Elisha. But God is not most active in his redemptive work in those things. He was not in the storm. He was not on the wind. He was not on the earthquake. He was not on the fire. And that is parallel to the anointing of Hazael as king who kills. The anointing of Jehu who kills. The anointing of Elisha who also destroyed those whom Jehu will not kill. And then the sound of gentle blowing. And we are not told that God was not in there. The sound of gentle blowing corresponds to the 7,000 of God's believing remnant that he said he will preserve. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson, clearly, from the parallel structure of the narrative is that God is most active, most present, most active, in his redemptive work and purpose, not in the dramatic and violent events of nature, nor in political and social and violent upheavals of societies, 
but in the preservation of the godly remnant and in their quiet and faithful witness. He is not most present and active in his redemptive work in the dramatic, violent events of nature, nor in the political and social and violent upheavals of society, but in the preservation of the godly remnant and in their quiet and faithful witness. That is where God is most present and that is where God is most active in his redemptive purpose. That is the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn. And that is the lesson God also wants us to learn who served him. For that is a very important lesson in the way God works out his redemptive purpose. And why is that? That's our second question. That leads us to our second question. Why is this lesson so important to learn. Why had Elijah to learn it? And why must we who are servants of God, why should we learn this important lesson? Well, two reasons. First, failure to learn that lesson often leads to frustration and depression. This is one of the problems of Elijah. Before this incident, we read of the story of Elijah's great contest in Mount Carmel. And because of the dramatic and violent events that happened in Mount Carmel, Elijah thought that Israel will finally recognize who God is and that they will turn away from their Baal worship. But that was not to be. Let's read the story. Because it's a kind of story that will give you goosebumps. In 1 Kings 18 verse 7, the contest. And let's just read the story, okay? 1 Kings 18, verse 17. When Ahab the king saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, the troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the bear. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, uh, but if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. And Elijah said to the people, I am, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen. Let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will put a I will not put a fire under it. Then you shall call in the name of your God. And I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people said. That is a good idea. So Elijah, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal. Choose one ox for yourselves. And prepare it first. For you are many. And call on the name of your God. Put no fire under it. Then they took the ox. 
which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on the journey and perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried out with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out on them. When midnight, what, mid midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the twelve tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. In other words, soak it with water. And he said, do it a second time. Then they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, today let it be known that you are God in Israel. And that I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you have turned their heart back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. The wood and the stones and the dust and lick up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Cease the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Now Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink. For there is the sound of roar of heavy shower." So Elijah went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of the Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And you know the story, he prayed and the rain came. A mighty, dramatic display of the power of God in the forces of nature. And for Elijah, that was a great victory. Now people will turn to Jehovah. But that is not to be. In chapter 19, verse 1, we read, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life and the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. You see, Elijah killed the prophets of Baal. He destroyed them. And he thought, now Israel will turn to the Lord. But Jezebel was not afraid of Elijah. In fact, she vowed to put him to death. And then in verse 3, And he, Elijah, was afraid. And rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father. He thought that the great victory in Mount Carmel and the great social violent revolution that happened in the death of the prophets of Baal 
would end the Baal worship and that people now will turn to the Lord. But that was not to be. Elijah had a tendency to glory in the spectacular and the dramatic. In the great contest in Mount Carmel, fire came out of heaven in answer to Elijah's prayer, and it consumed the stone altar, the burnt offering, the wood, the water that was poured out on the altar, and everything on it, and even the dust. In fact, the passage tells us that the fire even licked the water on the trench around the altar. And this brought people to open recognition that Jehovah, the God of Israel, is the true and the living God. However, this did not really change Israel. This did not really change and shake the wicked queen Jezebel. She sent the message to Elijah that she would have him killed within 24 hours and he her plan worked. Elijah was afraid and he fled. And he and it would mean that the great victory at Carmel seemed to have just fizzled out. It just came to nothing. Nobody came to support Elijah. He was alone. And all those in Mount Carmel who openly acknowledged Jehovah as God did not really rally behind Elijah to support him. And now he was all alone, running for his life. And that led to frustration, deep depression, that Elijah wanted to die. Therefore, Elijah had to learn this important lesson. It was crucial that he understand how God works. It is not the dramatic events in great and political upheavals that God is most active and present in his redemptive work and purpose. But it is in his preservation of a godly remnant. And it is through their consistent and quiet witness. That God is most active. Without pomp. Without fanfare. And that brethren is also an important lesson. We must learn. It is not through the earthquake. The storm. The great political upheaval. That is ripe in our nation. Where God is most active in his redemptive work and purpose. They will just come to nothing. They will still cling to their idols. They will interpret favorable events. To honor their God. But it is in the quiet work of the church. Faithful witness. Without pomp, without fanfare, that God is most present and active in his redemptive world. In other words, it is to our quiet, personal witness that he is active. Most active. It's not in the earthquake, not in the violent storm, not in the fire, not in the great political upheaval of our nation. But God is most present and active in his redemptive work. It is in the quiet work of his believing remnant. That he is most present and active. And if we as servants 
of the Lord fail to learn that lesson. And we are most prone to frustration and deep depression that will paralyze what we should be doing. So that's the lesson Elijah had to learn. That's the lesson we have to learn. It is in the things that we do for God. It is in as we speak the truth in love. Not through loud speakers that blares to the ears of the world. Caught in the internet and broadcast all over the globe. But in the quiet witness of his people. Without fanfare. Without pomp. That he is most active. We don't learn that lesson. We will, we will fall to Elijah's deep depressions. And there's another reason why we have to learn this lesson, why this lesson is important. Failure to learn that lesson leads to a despising of the days of small things. Look at Elijah. Because he stood up alone to challenge King Ahaz and the great political following of Ahaz in the persons of the prophets of Baal to a contest in Mount Carmel, he thought that he was the only one left who was faithful to the Lord. But that was not really true. God said to Elijah that he has prepared 7,000. He has reserved 7,000 who will not bow their knees to Baal. And that God was active through them in their quiet witness. Without pomp. Without fanfare. We're not alone, Elijah. And the same would be true of us. If we think God is most active in accomplishing his purpose in great dramatic events and social upheavals, then we will have the tendency to despise the day of small things. The work of God. Remember how he likens the kingdom it's like a mustard seed that slowly grows. It's like the little leaven that's mixed with the dough. And slowly it reshapes the dough. That is how God works. And that is where he is most present and active. In his redemptive purpose. So let us learn the lesson God wanted Elijah to learn. And let us continue to serve him as faithful witness. Without pomp, without fanfare, but faithfully in our daily existence, our encounter with people in our small talks, in our little gestures of kindness, in our faithful speaking of the truth in love. For that is where he is most active in his redemptive work. It is in what we can do to serve him as a witness. And as a faithful witness to the truth that God is most active in accomplishing his redemptive purposes.
Let's never forget that.